From our online graduate and undergraduate programs, to our unique speakers and discussions, to our special events like tonight, we have the same objective as our founder did when he began in 1934, and that is to find wisdom, to cultivate it, and to share it. Our founder, Manley Palmer Hall, was a man who had no educational credentials. He simply wanted to live well and wisely. A Canadian who once worked on Wall Street, he saw the emptiness of a life chasing riches and looked instead to the world's wisdom and to how to, how to develop it within himself. What he lacked in credentials he gained in being an autodidact and polymath, that is, he taught himself everything, remembered it all, and had a magnificent speaking and teaching ability that he conveyed here on this campus and in this auditorium for decades. As you will hear tonight, Manley Hall was one of the world's leading figures of the esoteric movement. He was well-traveled, but found his home, like so many great seekers, in what Stephen Heller calls the Alexandria of the contemporary world, Los Angeles. <laughs> Mr. Hall founded the Philosophical Research Society in 1934, built our fantastic library in 1936, and added this magnificent auditorium in 1959. In the 1970s, Stephen Heller joined Manley Hall to broaden and deepen the society's offerings especially in terms of Gnosticism and Jungian thought. And I'm happy to say that Dr. Heller is here with us tonight. We thank you, sir, for your contributions to the world's wisdom. Like Manley Hall, Mitch Horowitz is a self-taught, a great teacher and a writer, difficult to categorize. He's not a traditional academic. He writes too well for that. <laughs> He's not a preacher of the woo-woo, as he calls it, but he will defend the authentic desire behind such a search. He will not allow for an easy dismissal of anything without examination and historical context. And he's open to finding wisdom wherever it might exist, even in the unlikeliest of places. For example, in one of his latest pieces, he helps people understand the Church of Satan and Anton LaVey's unique contributions to our understanding of religion and popular culture. In Good Clean Satanism, what we can learn from the man who wrote The Devil's Notebook, Mitch writes, quote, I had once written off Anton as a showman and gifted musician with an instinct for the virtual kill. I saw his theology as little more than a secularized bastardization of British occultist Aleister Crowley, with a side of Ayn Rand's objectivist ethics and the will to self thrown in. I was wrong." Unquote. By the way, when's the last time you read the phrase, I was wrong? <laughs> Mitch threads the needle between the woo-woo of some New Age proponents and the dry and feckless scholarship of academe. After pondering it for a while, I finally found a good way to describe Mitch, for me at least. He's a mirror image of Christopher Hitchens. I still love watching the late Hitch take apart a poorly constructed argument offered in less than good faith. He was a genius, an amazing orator, marshaled intellectual history with a rapier wit. But Hitchens was a critic, which in Greek means to cut or to separate. Mitch is the opposite. He's an integrator, a builder, an edifier. He cuts to the heart of the matter and validates the heartfelt search, even as he helps direct it to what it is seeking. So enough of me telling you who he is and what he does. It's time to let him to do, do that. Speaking on Occult America, the secret history of how mysticism shaped our nation Please welcome our good friend, Mitch Horowitz. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. 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 
Thank you all so much. Um, we weren't sure what manner of entrance I should make tonight because I feel very strongly that I have no business sitting in the chair that uh, Dr. Stephen Heller and Manley Hall occupy. So, um, nor was I sure I should be wandering around the auditorium or campus with my backpack on, so I decided to ensconce myself in the broom closet, <laughs> which pitch black and very hot. <laughs> So I feel like I've emerged from a womb, and I'm very, very glad to be here. Um, and I'd very much like to thank Dr. Stephen Heller for being here tonight. I believe that, please. <laughs> Dr. Heller's intellect and erudition, I think, permeate the bricks and mortar of this campus in as much as Manley Hall does, and it's, it's very important and very special that his relationship with PRS has been reignited recently, and that flame is going to burn very brightly. This is also something of a homecoming for me, because the truth is, I really began my career as a historian, as a speaker, as a chronicler of metaphysical experience in this very room in September of 2005. And I recount this not because I want to get sentimental with you, but because I think there's a lesson in it that could be useful and practical. And since we are at the Philosophical Research Society, and this campus for many decades has been dedicated to the search for practical wisdom and human transformation, I think it's worthwhile to start off with a very brief personal lesson. I was on the phone one day with Obadiah Harris, the former president of PRS who did so much to rescue this organization from absolute financial destitution. And uh, I live on the east side of Manhattan. And he said to me, if you ever happen to be in the neighborhood, our doors are open to you and you're welcome to come and speak. And obviously, you know, being about 3,000 miles away, I'm not often in the neighborhood. But I responded immediately, and this was in the summer, and I said, I'll, I'll be there in September. I'll be there in September. And I delivered a talk at that time in September of 2005 entitled The Occult Philosophy in America, which was based upon the title of an enormously important book by historian Francis Yates, The Occult Philosophy in the Elizabethan Age. And after delivering that talk and transcribing it and thinking that I was going to make it into an essay, my wife said to me, no, that's not an essay, that's your book. And that became the basis for my book, Occult America. So in a very real sense, everything began for me here. And that brings me to what I, I hope will be a practical lesson. And if this speaks to any of you with any relevance, I would urge you to act on it and act on it immediately. Well, you can wait until the lecture is completed, but <laughs> thereafter, act on it. Um, one time the philosopher Jacob Needleman said to me, what do you do when someone offers you a gift? And brilliant student that I was, I looked at him with complete blankness. And he said to me, you accept it. You accept it. I was offered a gift by Dr. Harris back in the summer of 2005, and I instantly accepted it. I didn't think about airfare or hotel or where would I stay or could I bring my dog or make any excuses. I accepted it immediately. You all have burning within your hearts things that you wish to accomplish. You all aspire towards certain things in your private life that you feel very deeply within you. When someone comes to you and offers you an opportunity to be expressive of whatever it is that you want to do in the world, accept it immediately. Do not hesitate. I've always been grateful, not only for the invitation that was extended to me those many years ago, but that I accepted it instantly without any maybes, buts, or ends. And uh, that's something I would wish for everybody in this room, and it's what brings me here tonight. In speaking on the topic of occult America, I wondered 
what specifics I should zero in on because we have a limited time together this evening and I could certainly give a collapsed timeline of the various esoteric groups and personalities and occult orders, Freemasonic groups, Rosicrucian philosophy that influenced key figures in American life, that helped solidify certain things that I think are important and that remain vital and almost a kind of life's blood to American life. But what I think I would like to do is focus on one particular episode that I think is reflective of all the others and that I hope speaks very deeply to the situation that we find ourselves in as Americans today. It is obviously no secret and it is no remarkable observation to say that our country is in a period of profound political and social division. This is not created, but it is, it is coarsened and it is worsened by an online discourse, a social media discourse that is caustic, that is hostile, that is sarcastic. Social media did not by any means create any of these flaws in human nature, but it has deepened and it has worsened them. And I think that the greatest danger to our civic life in America is not who wins and who loses elections. There are gonna be peaks and valleys in our political life from whatever point of view and whatever perspective you occupy. And I'm not here to make a statement about politics. The endangering thing that we face, I think, as an American community today is not who wins or loses an election, but it is our absolute incapacity to speak to one another with any degree of reciprocal civility. The predominance of sarcasm as a normal language of everyday life, and this is what dominates on social media, is devastating to our ability to think devastating. Sarcasm has its place. Sarcasm can be very funny. It can be very elucidating. It can be very revealing. But for it to be the normative language of everyday life, for it to prevail on social media as the ordinary way that we talk to one another is absolutely devastating. By its very nature, it makes every conversation either hostile or a prelude to hostility. You're either ganging up on someone or preparing to gang up on someone. It's devastating. And yet, and yet, I do think that it's possible for us to move beyond it in the, in the, in the following sense. There is something that hasn't withered in America. There's something that hasn't died in America that's profoundly important and that makes me feel that we are going to emerge from this current moment of deep division. And it is this, the protection of the individual search for meaning. The protection of the individual search for meaning. That's the fundamental property that makes our society worthwhile. That's the fundamental property that Manly P. Hall felt had flowered in America for all its flaws, for all its profound disappointments, and we can all name them, and they should be named. Slavery, the destruction of the Native American culture, the mob mentality, for all these things, the protection of the individual search for meaning has endured, has prevailed, and I think remains absolutely strong and mighty. And that ties very directly into the flowering and the endurance and the influence of occult and esoteric philosophies in America, which form a kind of underground river, an underground reservoir that feed our national and civic life. And we don't teach our kids, we don't teach our young people about these things they're lost to us. 
there really is a secret history. There really is an occult history. And it's not the conspiracism that occupies people's attention on shows like Alex Jones or Infowars or Late Night Radio or Paranoia Online. We neglect true riches for fool's gold because there really is an occult history in our country. And I want to talk about an episode of it that I think touches on all of this and that should give us a sense of what we owe to the esoteric and how the esoteric might save us, might very well save us in the 21st century. I want to tell a story about the reflowering of an occult spirituality in Western life and how it has shaped our own culture. In the ancient world, in the antique world, in the decades immediately following the death of Christ, there was a brief but profoundly important flowering of philosophies that could be loosely grouped under the term of Gnosticism higher knowing. There were the hermetic teachings which grew in the city of Alexandria in the generations immediately following Christ. They were a combinative, syncretic set of mystical philosophies that grew out of Greek and Egyptian thought. Greek Egyptians who had mastered written language dedicated themselves to writing down in literary form Egyptian oral tradition and many of the hermetic writings in ancient Alexandria centered around the idea that the individual has the capacity to be a sacred vessel, a channel for the higher and that through the proper preparation the individual can know him or herself, not just as a being created in the image of the higher, but an actual capillary, an extension of the higher, whose thoughts within a certain cosmic framework are causative, are creative, whose thoughts in a localized manner can reproduce actual concrete conditions of human existence in the same way that we individuals were reproduced by newest or some higher mind. The various Gnostic teachings that flowered in the Mediterranean basin in the years following the death of Christ were in many cases a dynamic, radical, ecumenical marriage of Jewish, Christian, pagan, Persian, mystical ideas and visions. This legacy, this beautiful, beautiful legacy of radical ecumenism was quashed by cultural tides that were too strong to withstand, but never erased, never eradicated from the human record of experience, from the human search to know. And many of these ideas, after centuries of plague and chaos in Europe, began to bubble up and began to reemerge during the Western Renaissance. They were reintroduced, they were translated, <clears throat> they were rendered from Greek into Latin, they were rediscovered in ancient monasteries, they were imported to Europe from parts of the Arab world where they had been preserved, sometimes in Arabic, sometimes in Greek, sometimes in Latin. And again, the 
whenever the human community rediscovers occult ideas, and by occult, I mean the belief that there is an invisible dimension to life whose effects can be felt on us and through us. And this invisible dimension can be searched for outside of the boundaries of any individual doctrine or congregation or dogma. That's the occult vision. That's the occult ideal. That's the root of the term occult, occultist, hidden, unseen, secret. Secret and sacred share a common root. And the occult vision, each time it bubbles up, usually in time runs up against the resistance of established congregations, faith, dogma, And these periods of flowering drive it underground again and again, following the, the Renaissance experience. There was a backlash against occult experimentation throughout Central Europe in the early 1600s, contributing to ultimately the outbreak of the Thirty Years' War in 1618, a war that had many different causes, but in part, in part, it pitted the Catholic Church against Protestant forces and forces of radical Protestantism. It was a reaction, in part, against some of the challenges that were emanating from the occult flowering. It devastated the Germanic-speaking part of Central Europe from the Rhine River in the west to Bohemia in the east, and it devastated that beautiful, fruitful part of the European continent where many of the occult experiments were playing out for generations to come. But there's always rebirth. There's always rebirth. And another chapter of rebirth began to bubble up in the mid-19th century, where European artists and explorers were rediscovering the philosophies of the East, the Vedic traditions, the Buddhist traditions, and were asking themselves whether there was a way to recreate some of the ceremonial rites and rituals and mystery religions that had existed in the ancient and late ancient world that had flowered up again during the Renaissance, that had been quashed, and now we're experiencing a period in Europe and elsewhere of renewed flowering, renewed blossoming. One of the great figures in this occult revival as it continued to play out in the latter half of the 19th century was a mystic and occult explorer and world traveler, deeply venerated by Manly P. Hall, Madame H. P. Blavatsky. And Madame Blavatsky was actually responsible in many respects for reintroducing, for reinterjecting the concept of an occult search into modern Western life. The term occultism became popular through Madame Blavatsky's writings. And after spending several years in New York City, where she co-founded the Theosophical Society with Colonel Henry Steele Olcott, she and Colonel Olcott, and she was very proud to be a New Yorker, she was very proud to be an American. She said back home in Russia she had suffered all kinds of harassment and molestations, but in America it seemed she could do whatever she wanted, and the more scandalous she got, the more famous she got. And she was a favorite in the newspapers. She lived in the theater district at 8th Avenue and 47th Street, the tenement that she lived in on the second floor. Extraordinarily enough, is still there. It's an Econo Lodge today. And <laughs> I stop in there occasionally, and they're like, oh, here he comes again. He's going to talk to us about history. 
and um, the newspapers used to refer to her as the mad heathen of 8th Avenue, <laughs> and, and her occult salon was dubbed the Lamasery for a uh, Tibetan monastery. But what was actually going on in all of Madame Blavatsky's uh, notoriety in America was the process of actually familiarizing everyday Americans who read the newspapers with ideas of the East, Vedic ideas, Buddhist ideas, occult ideas, and this had a tremendous, tremendous ripple effect. When gurus of the East actually began to visit the United States starting, let's say, in the 1890s with Swami Vivekananda and continuing for generations after, including the visit of the, the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi to Southern California in, in 1959, Americans were able to make sense of these figures. They had a mental image of the robed spiritual teacher from the East, in part because of Madame Blavatsky's notoriety. She spoke of being a student of hidden adepts from the East, and the newspapers ate it up, and people who perhaps didn't read about Eastern wisdom in the works of uh, Edwin Arnold or, or Thoreau or Ralph Waldo Emerson, they had heard of the mad heathen of 8th Avenue, and they were able in some way, in an effect that lasted over a period of several decades, to make sense of the existence of hidden teachers or occult teachers from the East. Prior to that, most people in the West didn't even have a conception that in the Eastern world there was this whole cosmology and religious structure. They thought of the Eastern world as just a place that was a, a fount of superstition and ancient practices and, 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 and widows being thrown on funeral pyres, but they didn't have a sense that the Eastern world had a religious complexity and life that was vastly more ancient than anything we knew in the West. And while the newspapers were making fun of Madame Blavatsky, they were also inculcating Americans with the idea that there was this vast underground reservoir of Eastern mysticism of which she was speaking that really existed. So yes, you know, call her apartment the Lamasery, make fun of her because, you know, she smoked and kept stuffed apes in the corner and tropical plants in her bedroom and her partner, Colonel Olcott, would talk about mysterious figures materializing to him on 8th Avenue. Make fun of them all you wanted. What was actually happening was the American public was undergoing a kind of familiarity with concepts that it never would have known of as widely or as quickly or as fully without the existence of the mad heathen of 8th Avenue. And in an aspect of Blavatsky's life that the mainstream culture, even to this day, has never come to terms with, she made a heroic uh, decision, she and Colonel Olcott together, Colonel Henry Steele Olcott, her collaborator and intellectual partner, they made a heroic decision together in 1878 to leave the relatively comfortable environs of New York City, which was not a bad place to live if you had money in 1878, and relocate themselves to India, where they felt they could pursue their occult search closer to the source, closer to the fountainhead. Now, New York in 1878, as I said, was not a bad place. If you had some financial means, they had servants. You could have ice for your drinks. You could take a train out to Coney Island. You could eat in restaurants. There was gaslight. There was coal heat. Madame Blavatsky was not a young woman already well into middle age. She had difficulty walking. She was extremely obese. Colonel Olcott had a gouty leg. He walked with a limp. He had trouble with his eyesight. They were not in the prime of health, and it would have been very, very easy 
and natural for them to have wound down their careers in New York City. I mean, Madame Blavatsky would only live for about another dozen years in the relative comforts of the Lamasery over on 8th Avenue, having reporters walk up two flights of stairs to come see her, being the toast of the town in a certain sense, at least in terms of the avant-garde, hanging around with figures like Abner Doubleday and Thomas Edison and various actors and inventors who would come to her door. She could have been an infant terrible of the occult and stuck around New York City and died an easier life. But instead, she picked up with Colonel Olcott and moved to India because she felt that it brought her closer to the source of truth she was seeking. She believed in the existence of a primeval philosophy, an occult philosophy that underlie all our religious traditions like an underground river and that the cultures of the East were perhaps a closer vantage point to this occult philosophy than what she had experienced in the West or in Russia. And she and Colonel Olcott also recognized that the traditions of the East, Hinduism in particular, but also Buddhism, were withering under the weight of the machinery of colonial governance, and that there was state-funded missionary activity going on throughout many of the nations of the East, India in particular, and the traditions of Hinduism, this most ancient of religious faiths, were withering, were vanishing. And they went with the idea that they could perhaps not only learn by drinking from these ancient waters, but they could help reinvigorate these ancient waters. And reinvigorate them, they did. Colonel Olcott traveled throughout many nations of the East, opening up Buddhist schools in the nation of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Madame Blavatsky and her compatriots helped start the Indian National Congress, which was the policy-making board of people who were interested in freeing India from colonial domination. It was enormously heartening. It was enormously heartening to people who were forming liberatory movements in India to find that they had these dedicated Western allies who came not to proselytize, but to learn, and who came with a sense of political organization and speaking abilities, and in many regards, in many regards, the arrival of Madame Blavatsky in India was the striking of the first note that spelled the end of colonial domination of that country and that helped, helped reverse the decline of Hindu tradition. Madame Blavatsky suffered from various scandals in India. She suffered from scandals wherever she went. It was, well, she would have said it was part of her karma. And she eventually relocated to London, to the Notting Hill neighborhood in 1888. And yet, though she would live for only about another three years, this is where her influence, in a certain sense, in a certain sense, reached its highest point and came back to touch all of our lives today. While Madame Blavatsky was living in London in semi-exile in the year 1889, one year after she published her magnum opus, The Secret Doctrine, and only about two years prior to her death, 
there was another semi-exile living in London at the time, another outsider, another person who seemed to fit in absolutely nowhere. And that was a 19-year-old law student named Mohandas Gandhi. And Gandhi, at the time, looked nothing like the figure that has come down to us in history today. Manly P. Hall sculpted a magnificent likeness of Gandhi, which you can find in the library. Actually, I think it's in the bookstore at the moment, next to a magnificent likeness of Madame Blavatsky. And the bespectacled, bald-headed, robed Gandhi that has come down to us in history looked very, very different when he was a 19, 20 year old law student studying in London in the year 1889. Gandhi, by his own admission, desperately wanted to leave behind his Indian heritage and wanted to look every bit the part of the English barrister. So if you see photographs from him of that time, he looks extremely stiff and uncomfortable in a jacket with tails and a high starched collar and a full head of hair parted in the middle, gazing very seriously into the camera, trying very much to look the part of a proper student at the London School of Law. And things were profoundly difficult for Gandhi in London. First of all, he was a vegetarian. And why don't you just imagine being a vegetarian in London in 1889? You know, what would you subsist on? Cabbage? You know, and he had failed his matriculation exams at law school. He was desperately afraid that he was going to flunk out. He had terrible trouble, not surprisingly, fitting in to English society. He was very embarrassed by his Bombay accent, and he was profoundly lonely. And as he describes it, one day he was approached by two men who he thought were brothers. He later found out, because they were both very youthful looking, they were uncle and nephew. And they belonged to an organization called the Theosophical Society, which Gandhi was familiar with. And in his words, in his words, he knew the Theosophical Society, Madame Blavatsky's organization, as a pro-Hindu movement. He knew that it was a, a pro-Hindu, pro-liberatory movement. And he was pleased to meet these guys. And they asked him if he would join them in a little reading circle and would teach them how to read the Bhagavad Gita in the original Sanskrit. And Gandhi was embarrassed to tell them that he had never read the Bhagavad Gita in Sanskrit, in English, or in any language. Gandhi, at the time, viewed the Bhagavad Gita as something that belonged to the superstition of his parents' generation. He wanted to get away from the Hindu holy books and belief systems. He viewed it as an embarrassment that belonged to the old neighborhood. He was in London now, but he was profoundly lonely, and he was very touched that these two guys, these two theosophical brothers, as he put it, approached him in such a collegial and friendly spirit, and he said yes. And then they put another question to him. They said to him, you know, as it happens, the high priestess of the occult, Madame Blavatsky, is living in our Notting Hill home with her protege, the political reformer Annie Besant. Would you like to come meet them? And Gandhi was shocked and he was embarrassed because he felt, he said, I was just a mere Bombay matriculate. I was just a mere Bombay matriculate. How could I go to meet the notorious Madame Blavatsky and the political reformer Annie Besant. But he did go. He did go. And he said, and you will read this in almost no history book 
and you will read this in almost no biography of Gandhi, but you will read it, if you so care to, in his own letters and articles and statements. Test me on it. Test me on it. He did go, and he said it was the turning point of his inner life. It was the turning point of his inner life. Because, as Madame Blavatsky described to him, her vision of radical ecumenism, of religious and human equality, of all people emanating from one common primeval source. Her outlook, her descriptions, he said, moved him, moved him toward his first ideas of universal brotherhood and a transcendent human commonality that eventually translated into his philosophy of nonviolence. And you can hear, you can hear within Madame Blavatsky's central principle, the principle of her theosophical society, the early germination of Gandhi's ideas. That principle is there is no religion higher than truth. There is no religion higher than truth. No sectarian doctrine transcends human commonality, primeval philosophy, essential truth. Gandhi later said, all religions are true. All religions are true. And he added, all have some flaw in them. You can hear a family tree of thought, of ethics, between Gandhi and Madame Blavatsky. She gave him, as he recounts at the time, her book, The Key to Theosophy. And he said that this meeting and a copy of her book, The Key to Theosophy, returned him to reading the Bhagavad Gita with great vigor, and it became his daily guide to life, his daily, ever-present companion You can hear within, and you can read within, Blavatsky's works and statements and articles, a modern sounding, a modern sounding of the ideals of a primeval search for truth, an occult search, as she put it, that resonated throughout Hermeticism throughout Gnosticism in the late ancient world that found renewed voice during the occult flowering of the Renaissance, that found renewed voice during the occult revival that she did so much to initiate in the late 19th century. This idea of a primeval pristine, non-dogmatic, transcendent theology, philosophy that existed outside the borders of any religion that ran like an underground river beneath all our belief systems was the core principle to which Madame Blavatsky held. And her articulation of that principle that afternoon in London in 1889 to Mohandas Gandhi, as he put it in his own words, letters, and articles, ignited, ignited his own search for universal justice and his dedication to the idea that the only way, the only means of fulfilling that search was through nonviolence because of his belief 
in human commonality. Almost any biography, almost any history of contemporary India that even deigns to mention Madame Blavatsky will drop her name in for two or three pages at most, if that, if that, and describe her as almost this strange patch of crabgrass that Gandhi walked across for moments in his career, which completely contradicts, which completely contradicts statements that he made up until the end of his life, in the last year of his life in 1948, he told his biographer, Lewis Fisher, and this is an exact quote, theosophy is Hinduism at its best. Theosophy is Hinduism at its best because he felt that the ultimate goal of religion was the disillusion of religion, the evaporation of religion, that religion served as a means to its own demise so that we could see it was pointing us towards a universal vision. I'm going to flash forward about two generations to describe how what happened that day actually came back to our own country. Because we know that Gandhi waged probably the major democratic revolution of the 20th century rendering India into what is today, as a matter of fact, the largest democracy in the world in the 21st century. We know of his effectiveness, but what does this have to do with America? What does this have to do with America? I was recently in the city of Montgomery, Alabama, where I was for a civil rights tour with uh, my older son, Caleb, who is 13. And let me tell you, Montgomery, Alabama is a city that is on the move. There is a new lynching memorial there that is extremely important. There's a museum dedicated to Rosa Parks. There's a whole new generation of African-American artists who are doing wonderful things in Montgomery. Downtown is just starting to inch forward, just starting to kind of find its footing again. And I came away with the impression that this is a city on the move. There's a wonderful, wonderful organization there called the Equal Justice Initiative that occupies a place that was once a warehouse that held slaves. And under the, under the leadership of their visionary organizer, Brian Stevenson, they have erected a long overdue and enormously important lynching memorial. And at least this was my impression for the few days I was there. That place is on the move. And one of the places we visited was the Rosa Parks Museum, of course, commemorating the Montgomery bus boycott. And in the Rosa Parks Museum is this wonderful, very lifelike uh, mural of Martin Luther King, who lived in the city in 1955 who was there for the Montgomery bus boycott, sitting with his head bowed over in fatigue at his kitchen table. And above him are two objects. One is a crucifix, and the other is a portrait of Mahatma Gandhi. Now notice I said Mahatma, not Mohandas. His birth name was Mohandas. We call him frequently in the West today Mahatma. That's a term that means great soul. That was exactly the term that Madame Blavatsky used to describe her teachers from the East. And Gandhi was given that honorific title by Annie Besant, Madame Blavatsky's protege, who also met with Gandhi that day. Almost anywhere you go in America today, when people reference Gandhi, they will call him Mahatma Gandhi. That's a term that Madame Blavatsky used and that Annie Besant, with deepest veneration, bestowed upon Gandhi. You'll find that in almost no history book, almost no history book. His birth name was Mohandas, the name given to him 
which he embraced with veneration was Mahatma by Annie Besant and Madame Blavatsky. Those are facts. I had the opportunity in 2005 to interview Martin Luther King's firstborn daughter, uh, Yolanda, his eldest child. Yolanda, who was a wonderful, energetic person, a very searching person, a person who would have fit in very, very well here at the University of Philosophical Research. She was a real spiritual seeker. She died, unfortunately, at a very young age of 51 of heart failure in 2007. But I got to talk to her in 2005. And you can find the article online. I wrote a profile of her for Science of Mind magazine. It's called A Voice of Her Own, if you want to look it up. Don't do it now. <laughs> I don't want to see a bunch of phones come out. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> and <clears throat> Yolanda became a real seeker when she was older. She moved through different traditions and philosophies and ideas, as many of us do. She was interested in transcendental meditation. She was interested in different forms of mystical Christianity. She was interested in, in the New Thought tradition. And she said, when she was a little girl, when she was a little girl, she wanted so badly just to be a normal kid. You know, when her father was getting arrested and going to jail, you know, today we have this Disney-fied view, right, of the civil rights movement, We're almost self-congratulatory. We think, gee, aren't we a great country? We had a problem, yes, but this great figure of Martin Luther King came by and he solved the problem, and isn't that terrific? Let's put him in a Dodge Ram commercial, you know. Let's put him on a postage stamp. We're too self-congratulatory. We're too self-congratulatory because King uh, was not uh, venerated when he, when he was alive. And back in 1955, 56, 57, and, and well into the 1960s, when King was getting arrested and going to jail, Yolanda's own friends made fun of her and said, your daddy's a jailbird. And she did not feel proud. She felt ashamed. She was made to feel ashamed. And she wanted to be a normal kid. And you can't blame a kid for that. Not every kid wants to be an inspiration or wants to be a symbol. She was tired of being seen as an inspiration. She wanted to be a normal kid. And she said, growing up, she vividly remembered she vividly remembered, and this is well depicted in the mural at the um, Rosa Parks Museum, she vividly remembered the image of Gandhi above the family's dining room table. And she said, you know, I really had no interest in who this robed man was that daddy was so uh, attached to. But it was only later in adulthood when she entered her 30s, long after her father's assassination, that she came to realize the depth of his dedication to Gandhi and to Gandhian ideas of nonviolence. And King himself, who was in exile in his own country in the year 1955, in, 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 the, in the year of the Montgomery bus boycott, which occurred just two weeks after Yolanda's birth, and the King household was firebombed about eight weeks after Yolanda's birth. King was struggling with how to turn the call for social justice that he encountered in the Beatitudes, because he was first and foremost a Christian, how to turn that into a political program without indirectly promoting passivity. If you're taught to turn the other cheek, how do you, how do you wage political rebellion? And he was very focused on and frustrated with this idea from seminary up through one of his first pulpits at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. 
And this became a tremendously hot issue with the advent of the Montgomery bus boycott and the bombing of the King home. And he was asking himself day and night, day and night, how do I create a program of political protest that demands the fulfillment of the social gospel, but that is also confrontative, that doesn't, that doesn't promote passivity, that doesn't promote satisfaction with one's lot, that doesn't promote love of enemy to the exclusion of demanding and creating new and just policies. And he found half an answer in Thoreau. He was very touched by the work of Henry David Thoreau. But he found his full answer, he found his full answer when he attended a series of lectures on the thought of Gandhi. And he believed that in Gandhian nonviolence, he discovered a political method that didn't violate the Gospels. It was completely in tune with the principles of universal brotherhood that he had lived by in the Gospels, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, but it also withheld cooperation from an unjust society. It was profoundly self-sacrificing, but it was not passive because it withheld cooperation from an unjust society. That's what he discovered in Gandhi. Gandhi and the principles of Gandhi and nonviolence were for King the bridge that took Christ's universal ideas of justice into the political arena without being passive and withheld, actively withheld cooperation from a corrupt system. So you had boycotts, so you had sit-ins, and you had a radical, radical vision of self-sacrifice that I don't think our society has come to terms with. Gandhi, disco King discovered these ideas, King discovered these ideas in the work of Gandhi, who himself directly traced his own intellectual and moral gestation to what he had learned that day in London from Madame Blavatsky and Annie Besant, who spoke of the idea of a transcendent universal commonality. That was the ignition point by Gandhi's own testimony that moved him towards his philosophy of nonviolence. King's encounter with Gandhi formulated and crystallized his philosophy of political action, nonviolence, civil disobedience, non cooperation with corruption. These ideas did not just fall from the sky. These ideas did not just emerge from somewhere out of the ether. Madame Blavatsky's dedication to reviving the radical ecumenism of late antiquity, when religious systems and religious orders were being upended, when the individual search was playing out in all kinds of unconventional ways, when old regimes were crumbling and new ones, religiously speaking, hadn't fully taken their place. This dynamic vacuum instigated an atmosphere of Gnostic and Hermetic search, which again followed the pattern of going underground, bubbling up again during the occult renaissance, going underground during the Thirty Years' War, bubbling up again in the work of the European avant-garde in the, in the mid to late 19th century, finding expression in the work of Madame Blavatsky, igniting 
this sense of transcendent brotherhood in Gandhi, igniting this sense of transcendent fraternity in King. And placing us today at the precipice, at the precipice of a tremendous choice and a tremendous sense of search. The flowering of these ideas in American life grew out of what Manly P. Hall felt was the central and most important foundational principle of American life. And again, that was the protection of the individual search for meaning. As long as that search is healthful and endures, I do think it's possible and even likely that we will emerge from this period of intense friction. I do not have, and I would not venture to offer, a political or social program for anybody. Because the truth is, these are human devices. Politics is really just a delivery system. How are you supposed to create a just policy? How are you supposed to create a reasonable policy? There are all kinds of different policies that could cover the various bases, the various needs of human life. But the creation and sustenance of an intellect that can arrive at rational policy must come, must come through the individual search for meaning. The search that was seen in the life of Madame Blavatsky, seen in the life of Manly P. Hall seen in the life of a Gandhi, seen in the life of a king. The search has to be something that we venerate as the overall meaning of human agency, of human intellect, of human ability. It will not come it will not come through the reduction of life into sarcasm or coarseness or scoring points off of one another or the recitation of catechism. And we who occupy the outer reaches of the culture of search, I believe, have to be very careful in our own institutions and writing and lives that we don't slip into catechism. It's very, very easy for us to start to recycle terms and phrases. You know, um, we have our vocabulary words within the alternative spiritual culture that we grow too attached to. A friend of mine used to joke that um, <laughs> if you do something, if you manifest some kind of behavior and you don't like it, you call it personality. And if you do like it, you call it essence, you know. But the <laughs> These are just imaginary things, you know. Show me essence, show me personality, show me inner, show me outer. Show me ego, show me consciousness, define consciousness. We can't even define it. You know, I love the fact that our friends over at Google think they're creating artificial intelligence when we can't even define what intelligence is, what consciousness is. Is it local, is it non-local? Is it just the equivalent of bubbles, uh, you know, as what you would find in a glass of soda? you know, just an epiphenomenon of carbonation, and then when we die, the bubbles are gone, you know. We can't define any of these things, and that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Because I think stripping away the vocabulary words and the uses of language that come to us too easily and too quickly, maybe, maybe that's the moral crucible that we face today in the search. You know, we, we may not have the same uh, mission before us today that people had in the 1950s and the 1960s in the age of the Montgomery bus boycott. I, I don't know. That's for the individual to determine him or herself. I don't know. 
But I am absolutely certain, I am absolutely certain that our capacity to arrive at new systems and new policies and new ideas, one way or another, is going to arise from the intimate search. And the legacy I think we have been granted is this protection of that individual search, which has not withered. It may be under assault, it may be under attack, and believe me, believe me, it's not just the other guy or the other side who's to blame when the search comes under attack. Believe me, because uh, Greg Sawyer, I never thought I'd be quoted defending um, Anton LaVey, but, you know, fine. I mean, I, <laughs> I do defend Anton. <laughs> and I, I was touched and surprised that, that Greg um, used that in the introduction, you know. <laughs> but I will, I'll, I'll use it to offer you a small anecdote. There's a, a center in New York where I spoke at recently, and I gave a talk on historic Satanism, and um, somebody there, uh, an astrologer, she was described to me as a beloved astrologer. I have no idea who it was, because the beloved astrologer didn't call me to say, why are you doing this? She, she ratted me out on the administration, and <laughs> they said, well, she said she's going to quit the center if you give this talk, because, uh, you know, this is going to open the door to bad things. And I said, look, this is just a search. This is just a search. We're just here to search together. You know, there, there is a, a, a tradition of the so-called left-hand path in Vedic life, in American life, at different points in history. We're just going to ask our, the question, what is out there? And um, I was told, well, you know, you have to change the name of the talk. The talk was called Satanism, the Dark Alternative. I was told, you have to change the name of the talk. And I said, look, you know, I'm sorry we can't um, work this out. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to change the name of the talk because my, my point is to be blunt about what I'm exploring. I'm not trying to disguise it or to provoke or to provoke. I just want to ask a question. What is out there? What is out there? And it worked out in the end. We all got together and everything was okay. But don't make the mistake of thinking it's just this guy or it's just that guy who's limiting the search. Because you can bump up against it in very surprising ways, in very surprising places, including from you know, people who you may think occupy your own neighborhood. All I'm really saying is that if we look at the lives of these figures that I've been talking about and the precious, precious candlelight of wisdom and possibility and search that they carried through so many different thunderstorms and that still lights our way today. Look at and dedicate yourself, dedicate yourself to that search, that transcendent search. It's your legacy and your exercise of the search and your deepening of questions and your refusal to be bound by catechism or concept or vocabulary your refusal to be bound by convention. That is you. That is you fulfilling the promise of this individual search that has wound its way, that has wound its way in this precious, precious thread from antiquity to the current day. And the true legacy of occult America, the flowering, the blossoming, the protecting of occult America exists truly, truly, I say this, in all of you and is seen through each time you dedicate yourself to the deepening of a question and to the asking of the question, the wonderful sacred question, what is out there? And occult America and the flowering of the great search exists at this moment in you. And I thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.